Hi, everyone. Welcome to our talk, Building Zero Trust with Envoy. I am Pradeep, and this is Florin Koras. Our talk is a success story of using Envoy in production. We'll walk you through how we started with Envoy and how Envoy scaled as we add more users and customers. So first, what is Zero Trust? When talking Zero Trust, people always compare it with traditional VPN. In traditional VPN, what happens is when you get access to your VPN, you get access to all applications in the network. In Zero Trust, there's no implicit trust. Every access to an application is authenticated and authorized before providing access. Zero Trust offers several benefits, such as least privileges, access control, continuous monitoring, and uh, protection of resources. Today, we are going to talk about our product, which is an uh, implementation of Zero Trust application access, which is to secure access to individual applications. More specifically, it is clientless ZTAA. What is clientless ZTAA? So we have all used VPN. And to use VPN, you have to install a software on your Mac or any device. In clientless ZTA, there's no need to install any software. All you need is your standard web browser. So right now, we support um, web applications, both HTTP and HTTPS, SSH, and RDP. Our solution is also multi-tenant. That is, it can accept multiple users and customers in the same node. Um, let me give you a very high-level overview of how uh, it all fits together. Let's say a customer, one, wants to expose his private application app one on the internet. And now, he would connect his data center to our ZTA data center. The way he connects is outside the scope of this discussion. Once he connects, uh, he'll be able to configure. We'll go through the configuration in the next couple of slides. But ultimately, he'll get a unique external URL. Once he gets the unique external URL, he shares it with his users. And the users will now enter this unique URL in the browser. Once the uh, user enters the unique URL, uh, they hit the ZTA proxy node, we do authentication, authorization, and then route the traffic to the internal customer data center. No, so why did we uh, ch chose Envoy? We needed a reverse proxy with a very good HTTP, HTTPS um, support. And since it is a browser-based application. Also, we like the Envoy flexibility to configure it in terms of filter, filter chains, and so forth. You will see more on that in the coming slides. Performance is also really good, and we needed VPP integration. The reason we needed VPP integration is many of our internal apps are also configured with VPP, and having a proxy that is integrated with VPP will make our life much easier. Finally, it is open source, which means like we get to get a use all the uh, open source contributions by the other community. We'll show you examples of what we are using down the slides. So we'll talk on uh, how an admin configures the application. So admin gets access to our dashboard. He says, hey, this is the destination ap uh, application's private IP address. Um, this is the unique external URL that I want to use for this application any custom headers that he wants to set to access the application, and finally, the connection type which, space, uh, which says whether it's a HTTP, RDP, or SSH application. Once he configures it, all these configurations are pushed to the proxy node. We have a control plane component which reads this XDS, con uh, sorry, these configuration and converts it to XDS and pushes it into Envoy. Now, Envoy is aware of all these applications along with the configuration. And networking is done by VPP, and Envoy runs on top of uh, VPP. And the way we monitor our uh, Envoy is like we have a local Envoy app running every couple of seconds, which makes sure that Envoy is healthy. If the Envoy node is not healthy, we take it out of rotation. We use Prometheus for scraping, and all the logs are pushed to Grafana. Now that uh, admin has configured the application, he would share the unique URL with the user. So the user enters the URL in the browser. It hits our ZTA proxy node, then goes through VCL, VPP, sorry, VPP first, then VCL, and finally hits our custom auth filter. Initially, this was written in VASM. So the author, oh, sorry, auth filter identifies that this is a new connection. 
So I have to authenticate this user. So it redirects the user to the, to the customer's IDP. And once the user enters his username, uh, password, and all of this stuff, he comes back to uh, the same auth filter. Now that he has come back, uh, we have to uh, authorize the user. And to do this, we send the user to our control plane component where a policy is evaluated. The two inputs to the policy evaluation are identity, which we currently did with the uh, IDP stuff, and second is posture. Posture is nothing but uh, web browser he's using and uh, operating system he's running on and so forth. So with these two information, we run the policy. Again, admin gets to decide what are the policy and posture that should be applied for this particular application. Once that is done, the policy evaluation will, from the control plane will give a verdict to the auth filter saying whether the user is allowed or blocked. If the user is allowed, we inject some metadata into the uh, filters and then and connect them to the private application. Else, we send them to a block page. So why did we go with Wasm and Go? So the reason we went with Wasm and Go in our initial implementation was most of our control plane components was written in Go, and we want to start reusing all the libraries. We compiled it with proxy Wasm slash tiny Go for all the um, Wasm stuff, and any metadata that was needed was also injected via the filter configuration. We hit a couple of limitations. One was that not all libraries can be uh, compiled with tiny Go. The second thing is our control plane was evolving at a rapid pace, and it was becoming uh, really tedious for us to uh, inject all the metadata via the filter config. So to talk more on how we scale the system, I give it to Florian. Thank you, Pradeep, and hello, everyone. Apologies for my voice. I'm here to keep Matt uh, company, I guess. So our original design worked pr uh, pretty fine for a limited number of applications, and by that I mean by limited, I mean uh, thousands to tens of thousands of applications. But um, as the number of customers started to grow and uh, we started forecasting and dimensioning for uh, larger deployments, we realized that our existing, our then existing architecture would only take us so far. So. Um, why was that? Well, if we zoom in and look at how everything is tied together within our solution, we see that we had a listener, we had a bunch of filters, the filters had matches, in fact, as many matches as we had applications, and for the purpose of this presentation, we're just going to assume that the number of applications is proportional to the number of customers or, or tenants for us. And those filters would then point to routes, the routes would point to clusters, and we did modify those clusters. Uh, we, uh, we added, we, we stored in them additional um, per application and per tenant metadata. And I guess it's important to know here that we're running with custom uh, transfer sockets, and um, those customers transfer, transfer sockets are needed because we wanted a bespoke API and into our networking stack that we run within VPP. But back to the original point. So um, we see here that everything, and by everything I mean filters, routes, and clusters, everything scales linearly with the number of applications and implicitly with the number of, of um, orgs or tenants for us. And uh, okay, which one out of these is not scaling too well? And it turns out that um, with just some basic profiling, we quickly understood that the clusters are not uh, are the worst out of the bunch in in scaling um, from a memory perspective. And uh, it's to the point where just configuring you know another IP within the load balancing set of a cluster would significantly alter the a cluster's memory footprint. Um, within our environments, which are relatively memory constrained, just configuring something like 10 to 20,000 applications would quickly run us out of memory, which in a multi-tenant environment, as you can imagine, is not ideal. So what could be done about it, what, or what was wrong? And well, we obviously had to reduce the number of clusters. And uh, but the question then is, to how many? And more importantly, what to do about the tenant-specific metadata that we run within uh, within our clusters? And 
Uh, it turns out that answering the first sort of puts a constraint on the second. So after some careful planning, we realized that, okay, we needed to reduce uh, the number, or we had to retain uh, a number of clusters that's equivalent to the number of applications that we need to serve. And to be explicit, we needed to retain as many clusters as uh, the, the applications like HTTP, HTTPS, RDP, and SSH. And the fact that we were already planning to reuse clusters across tenants already made us realize that we needed some dynamic mechanism of injecting metadata in our downstream filters, perhaps with the help of our control plane, and then propagate that metadata into uh, our clusters. Um, so how did these two improvements or these lessons improve our, our architecture in the end? Well, first up, we moved away from WASM and, and we implemented our new native C++ um, async um, auth filter. Now, an important difference um, with respect to the WASM filter is that this new filter no longer acts as a proxy on, um, on the slow path. Instead, it leverages the HTTP async client for um, posting policy or queries to uh, policy evaluation queries to our control plane. Um, then, because we have to com somehow control our, our cluster programs, our, cr our clusters, the control plane not only provides um, uh, verdicts to these policy evaluations, but now injects tenant-aware metadata into the auth filter. Auth filter propagated via um, stream metadata into our clusters and implicitly into our transports. Um, in other words, we came up with a relatively simple architecture, albeit I'm sure not very original, whereby we, um, customer streams uh, are evaluated in our uh, downstream filters. They're annotated with metadata that's tenant aware, and then eventually that metadata propagates into our clusters and programs, uh, programs are transports. Um, the rest of the architecture stays pretty much the same, but these two changes were, were enough to ensure a 10x, if not a 20x, scaling from our perspective um, with no significant impact to our data plane performance, uh, both from a scale and throughput perspective. And speaking about throughput, per flow throughput in our data plane is actually limited by our cloud provider to somewhere around five gigabits per second. and. As far as we can tell, we can reach this type of throughputs with even one stream, given that we run on the right type of hardware. <coughs> Sorry about that. So, um, as you can imagine, we were pretty thank you. Uh, we were pretty satisfied with this result. Um, uh, that's not to say we we don't think that there's more scaling to be obtained, but that's going to be a future project. Another important uh, limitation of our ZTA solution uh, as per request from our customers was the ability to bring your own domain. That is the ability to uh, serve customer provided uh, domain names. Obviously for this customers would have to program their DNS servers to point to, to our ZTA clusters via DNS names or whatever other equivalent mechanism and uh, to state the obvious, customers would have to provide their certificates and keys uh, to us. Now, conceptually, this is very simple to understand. Scaling this in practice uh, in, in an environment that's multi-tenanted with relatively strict uh, scaling requirements means that preloading of the certificates and keys in Envoy at startup uh, or during a listener update is a, a non-starter. So we, we started, uh, at the, or at the start of this endeavor, we already realized that we needed on-demand fetching of uh, certificates and keys. Now, it turns out that for this, we thought that we we're gonna write our own TLS handshaker, but just as we were preparing to start work on this feature, we realized that um, uh, a contribution uh, showed up in, in, in our community whereby um, the, the TLS transfer socket would ex was extended to provide um, overriding support for the selection of the TLS certificate. I guess this is a good of, of a moment as any other to just express our gratitude to the Envic community as a whole because, uh, yeah, um, for being 
on the one hand, very open and accepting of this sort of changes, and also to explicitly just say thank you, Dell, for the patch, because that was part of the work that we needed. Sorry for that. Um, the other part consisted on um, plugging in via the secret manager into the SDS TLS secret provider, and with these two components, we already had uh, an async certificate retrieval mechanism. Um, um, that, in addition to being an async, uh, also retained the SDS syntax over, um, over the certificate retrieval API, which happened to be one of the requirements as we started work on, on this feature. So how does all of this come together eventually? Well, we, one would have or we would have to configure the new TLS certificate selector on our TLS downstream socket. Whenever the SSL layer now gets a request, it uh, invokes the uh, certificate selector. The certificate selector, uh, if it has already cached the cert, it provides it back. If not, it pauses the TLS session. It proceeds to creating um, a new SDS TLS certificate provider with some custom config. Afterwards, we just reuse the existing infrastructure within Envoy, the SDS infrastructure within Envoy to go to our SDS service, which is external. Once, this, uh, once the cert is, sorry for that, is retrieved, um, it's provided back to the SSL layer, which resumes the TLS session and uh, subsequently, hopefully, completes the TLS handshake. And to the side here, you have some logs that just explain um, some of the interactions between the components as they happen. And with this, back to Pradeep to tell you about RDP. So uh, when we started this project, we started with only web applications, which is HTTP and HTTPS. But as we got more customer feedback, we wanted to support uh, RDP and SSH also in the browser. So to do that, what we did is we implemented an RDP and SSH proxy behind uh, Envoy. So, what happens is like, the reason we had to do this way is because we can reuse all the zero trust functionality that we had already built in. Um, so an, another requirement that we needed for doing RDP and SSH was that uh, we need WebSocket um, support in. So we looked into the code and it was just two lines of change and that is it. <laughs> we have RDP and SSH support. And finally, these are some of our lessons which we learned along the way. Uh, it's always a good practice to lock down your admin interface. Uh, there's good examples in the community discussions. Go look to, into it. Similarly, also restrict your uh, Prometheus scraping endpoints to only a set of IP ranges that it should be scraped to. So when we started, we thought that writing a C++ uh, filter might be tricky, but it is not that tricky. Uh, there is plenty of examples in the Envoy repo. Go look at them. Uh, it's easier to write, maintain, and also it allows you to pull down the latest uh, and greatest features that similar to what we did for Bring Your Own Domain. Um, Florin mentioned that we moved from proxying to asynchronous request and response with our control plane. This can be a little tricky. Look at the um, example codes again in the filter chains uh, because that will help you to avoid some of the common edge cases and pitfalls. Finally, sanitize your headers if you're injecting uh, metadata between your components. If you're not careful, users might be able to inject the, any data as metadata. We have been always using the latest and stable uh, version of Envoy, and it's been very helpful to pull in the latest, uh, uh, latest features and also any new upcoming features. That's all we had for our presentation. We, um, time for questions. Uh, it's a the question was if the C++ code is open or proprietary. Uh, the code is proprietary to us because many of that is uh, specific to our implementation of the zero trust. for you, the question. Yeah, the question is, uh, you show a separate um, SSH and RDP proxy uh, in other than your ZTA proxy. Uh, the reason is this, um, Envoy proxy right now handles all our HTTP, HTTPS, and so forth. 
if you are implementing a, a RDP and SSH in browser, you have to do much more than just HTTP and HTTPS. You need to have uh, the user's uh, screen drawn on, on all of that. We didn't want to put both of them in one place and or extend on why that way. So we want to isolate both of them, and that's the reason we did that. The other reason is like we have RDP and SSH proxy as an additional cluster. So in case of more load, let's, let's say, um, we can always scale the RDP and SSH as additional clusters. So for these reasons, we wanted and did it this way. So the question is, um, is this product or uh, implementation only internal or external? And the second question is, how do you guys test it? Um, I'll answer the first question, which is, uh, the product is widely av available. We didn't want to put the name here, but uh, it's available um, across um, uh, like several uh, data centers and so forth. So um, it's, everyone can use it as long as you buy uh, it from the Cisco. The second is, uh, how is the testing done? We have uh, different levels of testing, um, uh, like we have our dev, stage, uh, prod, QE environments, and we also do load testing. Um, that's one thing. And again, we also have our um, internal security teams who regularly make sure that uh, all what we do are also very secure, and we don't expose any vulnerabilities. Anything you want to add, Florian? Um, the question is if we're setting only one filter per FQDN and if that was not scaling. Did I get that right? Um, so in our environment, and obviously it depends a lot on your configuration, especially how many IPs you have per, um, per load balancing set within the, your cluster, going anywhere above 10 to 20,000 clusters starts to be a, a significant amount of memory. Oh, okay. okay. The question is, why did we, why do the clusters consume so much memory? And uh, to be honest, I do not remember the results of the profiling, apart from IPs being a big concern. Pradeep, do you remember? Nothing at the top of mind, except that at around 10K uh, to 20K, we started like uh, it becoming significantly hard to even reload the config. That's all I remember. So do you, do you have any online um, Maritika just said that it keep alive is a big component of that. Thank you. Uh, two questions. So the first one, uh, deferral. Did, did we try using deferral with our clusters? Did I get that right? Um, in other words, async usage of the clusters, I guess, or on demand. Gotcha. Uh, the answer is no, we have not, but actually that's a very interesting suggestion and probably we should have considered it. Uh, the, second, um, the second question was what's our experience with uh, VPP, running on with, uh, with VPP, and I guess I'll take that one. Uh, for now, for us, it's been very good, but you're talking also to the maintainers of the VPP code. So uh, that means as far as we can tell, and work on VPP or VCL integration with Envoy started something like four years ago. As far as we can tell over the last 
two to three years with code running in, in production, things have been pretty stable. But we also know what we're doing. So uh, meaning a VPP is not necessarily uh, easy to configure. So if there's any other folks in the community who would like help for that, feel free to reach out. I will also add, we always <coughs> pull the latest stable version and run it. So any bugs or any uh, issues we find, it's always uh, in the VPP uh, right away. We don't uh, like uh, wait for a couple of months or years. <laughs> so it's always there, whatever changes we find. And Florian is always there to help. question is if we've hit any sort of issues. Uh, I'm assuming there was a hint about performance and security there. Um, and if updating, keeping up with uh, Envoy affected us in any shape or form. You want to take it, Pradeep? Sure. So um, overall, uh, from our security perspective, we always want to be on the latest and uh, greatest because it will have always the latest security fixes to go in. And we also uh, subscribe to all community, uh, what you call security uh, disclosures, so that we can be t stay on top of it. Um, what was the second question? No, that, that was it, it performance. Okay, performance. Uh, we haven't hit any performance. At the same time, uh, what we do is, as soon as we pull our latest version, uh, we also make sh uh, we run all our regression suit to make sure that it at least passes our threshold for what we need. So we have custom uh, workloads to make sure which we run daily and also weekly to calibrate the performance of our, the system. Thank you, and I believe there was a question there. Yep. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, your voice is a bit too low for me, or my cold is catching up to my ears. Uh, could you repeat the question? Right, so the question is, we're running a multi-tenanted proxy. What do we do about the backends? Because they could use overlapping IP addresses. Did I catch that right? Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna take that one very quickly. So the answer is, the proxy itself is network multi-tenanted as well. We haven't gone into those details. Perhaps we were going to do it in, in another talk, but that's part of the reason why we're running everything, and that's why Pretty mentioned that we're running everything on top of uh, VPP. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, that could be, uh, um, so the main reason we want to, go ahead. Question. Okay, the question is, uh, what are the reasons uh, you guys moved away from Wasm to, um, Wasm to C++, native C++? The first reason was like, um, we wanted to share some of the libraries between our uh, native, uh, sorry, from our control plane to, to Envoy, Wasm. But when we use TinyGo, not all libraries could be uh, compiled. That's first reason. So this made us choose what to do long run, like, hey, do we restrict our control plane or this VASM? That's one thing. The second thing is, as uh, Florin kind of alluded or actually mentioned, we started having complex metadata injection into the custom transport socket, which was becoming more dynamic as we started adding more features. So that's the second reason. Third thing is, it opens us up to adding new features on top of 
uh, on top of what is available, like bring your own domain using custom TLS, uh, building on top of custom TLS handshaker and so forth. So we were seeing that we needed to have more control and interact directly with the um, C++ slash code. I'll add that Wasm was very good for us as, as we started to work on this. However, I believe at least at the time we started really thinking seriously about C++ that there was no possibility to inject stream metadata uh, within, within Wasm. I don't know if that has changed over the years. At that time, yes, yes. Sure. Uh, what would you like to know about? Like, is it <coughs> sure. Um, again, um, the control plane is. The, okay, let me repeat the question. Uh, can you explain more of our control plane? Our control plane is also custom made, um, and um, it's not open source. I would add that it has two components. First of all, it's the the Go control plane for Envoy. Good part of it. Thank you for that. It's awesome. Um, and the part that it's uh, not open source that Pradeep mentioned is anything that has to do with policy evaluation. So basically the business logic. Thanks everyone, bye.